Okay, and it says record, so. All right, well. I do see that some people are coming in. All right, well, as people are coming in, let me just uh, introduce myself. I'm Joy Cardine, and I'm going to be your host today. We are, if you are looking for um, finding Deciding what's true in a polarized society with Professor Michael Wagner. You've come to the right place. We will be starting officially at a couple of minutes after one o'clock, but we wanted to give you time to come on in and get settled and to make sure you're comfortable with the technology. If you are having any technical uh, problems, I'm sorry, I can't help you, <laughs> but I think Trish Yaccarino, my colleague, uh, we'll be able to help you if you're having some some audio issues or or anything else. You can you can um, send a, a written note if you're having problems. But we will get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, Professor Wagner is going to present for about 40 minutes, and then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions via written text through the chat function. We're asking people to use chat which is located bottom center of most screens so if you look down on the bottom of of your zoom screen there's a little um little balloon bubble that says chat you click on that and then you can type your message where it says type message here and then you can um, hit send and and we will uh, collect and gather all of these questions through the through the um, presentation, and I'll present them to Professor Wagner at the end. We're asking you to use chat instead of the Q&A function. Some of you might use Q&A and other Zoom webinars, just so we have just one place to look rather than um, double places to look. It's a little, makes it a little easier. So again, please use chat if you have a question or use chat if you have a, a problem or issue right now, and we'll try to take care of it before before we start. So, settle in, and um, and I hope you enjoy the uh, presentation. We have about um, 75 people who are registered, so that's a nice sized crowd. I'm happy that you were able to join us. This is my first Plato Zoom webinar that I'm hosting. I have uh, hosted some of these for other organizations, including the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. And most of them went smoothly, but I did have um, one where my Zoom connection just went poof and I was gone. And if that should happen, I hope it won't happen. I don't think it will happen. Trish Yaccarino, my, um, my colleague, will will take over um, if I can't get back on. So yeah, each one of these has been a little bit different, but I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that we will have a, a successful broadcast. Very happy to have with us today, uh, Professor Mike Wagner. Some of you probably know him from his appearances on Wisconsin Public Radio. I used to work at Wisconsin Public Radio and he was a, a fairly frequent and favorite guest. And it was always good to hear his insights on all things um, media and politics. And so I thought that you would be interested in hearing from him today, especially this topic, because um, fake news and fact checking and um, uh, partisan media outlets are, um, are all a big part of this election cycle for sure. And uh, we'll talk, I'm sure, about how big of a problem um, all of this is in this uh, really uh, divisive election cycle. So we will um, we will hear from from Professor Wagner and his uh, his research on this topic. And again, welcome any questions you have. He's willing to feel just about uh, any questions. So. You might have an example from the news that you want to bring up. You might have some thoughts about about uh, the, the role of uh, fact checking in, um, in the campaign. You may have uh, some examples of fake news that or what you think is fake news and, and, and your thoughts on, on how big of a problem this is for our democracy. So we will, um, we will welcome your, your thoughts and questions on, on all of that. So again, we will, be, um, we will be recording this session too. I think you already know that because I think you had a click um, 
click a, a, an acknowledgement that uh, you knew that it was being recorded. So it is going to be recorded and we will archive it on our website, the platomadison.org website. So in case you miss anything today, you can go back and, and, and watch, uh, watch it again. You can also let your um, friends and family know about it in case uh, they might want to uh, check it out as well. So we will be um, getting started in just a couple of minutes. You can get settled, grab a cup of coffee or whatever you want um, for your uh, viewing pleasure and um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, we're going to be started in about one minute, actually, and we have 48 people with us right now. So I hope that a few more will come in. I know sometimes uh, we register for things and then and then forget about them, but um, people might be tuning in just uh, just at the uh, last minute. So we'll, we'll give another minute for people to uh, to log in. All right, I think we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome to Deciding What's True in a Polarized Society, a talk from University of Wisconsin-Madison Professor Michael Wagner, brought to you by Plato Madison. I'm Joy Cardine, a retired Wisconsin Public Radio talk show host. I'm a member of Plato and I'm happy to be your host today with help from our lecture committee chair and Zoom facilitator, Trish Yaccarino. We are recording this session for the viewing pleasure of those who could not join us live. It will be accessible under the past lecture section on the platomadison.org website. In this talk, Professor Wagner will review issues like fake news, fact checking, and selective exposure to like-minded media outlets and how we decide what's true, especially during a divisive election cycle like we are having right now, when it seems like we are getting a major breaking news story every couple of minutes. After his presentation, we should have about 20 minutes for your question, and you can type them anytime by using the chat function that's located at the bottom of your screen. Click on chat, then type your question and hit send. Trish and I will be monitoring the chat and we will gather your questions and then present them to Professor Wagner when he's finished. Well, let's get to it. Michael Wagner is a professor of journalism and mass communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He holds affiliations with the Department of Political Science and the La Follette School of Public Affairs. He's a senior fellow with the Center for Communication and Democracy and a faculty affiliate at the Elections Research Center at UW-Madison. He is also the founding director of the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal at UW-Madison. And I do miss talking with him on Wisconsin Public Radio, but you can still hear him with my former co-workers on the Ideas Network. And you can see or read about his research and analysis on many other local state and national media outlets. Please welcome with me, Professor Michael Wagner. And thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joyce. Nice to see you again, um, and uh, virtually, but still nice to be here. Mm -hmm. and, and thanks to Plato for the invitation uh, to talk with you all today. I'm, I'm happy to have the chance to uh, talk for a while and then uh, more importantly hear your questions and have a conversation with you um, once um, we're through the the main presentation so i will now uh, share my screen and hope that uh, you are all seeing it and 
um, assuming that you are, we'll go ahead and start um, talking a little bit about why we're here today. And that's to try to unpack how it is we as people who care about democracy and, and care about the future of, of our country and our state and our community can decide what we believe to be true in such a polarized environment. It's an environment that is polarized in terms of the electorate between um, increasingly uh, extreme uh, Democrats and Republicans. It's polarized uh, in terms of the available sources for information that we have as compared to how things used to be. Uh, and it's uh, polarized uh, in terms of how we behave on social media. Um, in, in fact, it's even slipping into uh, ways that we, we might not have imagined 10 or 15 years ago when it comes to actual just conversations between citizens. Uh, one, uh, one, one result from a, a, a couple of surveys actually we've done at the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal show that more than 50% uh, of Wisconsinites say that they've stopped talking politics with a friend of theirs because of disagreements about state politics, and 30% have ended a friendship outright or cut a family member out of their lives because of their disagreements. And a lot of these disagreements we've learned are over whether particular claims that uh, a leader might make on one side or the other says is true. And so I wanna talk today uh, and then talk with you uh, in conversation afterwards about how it is we decide what's true uh, in a polarized society. Uh, the two things that can really help us the most, I would argue, are finding news coverage that we can trust and having an open mind ourselves, as, as we'll, I hope, come to understand and come to agree um, over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, a lot of the problem lies within ourselves and how we choose to interpret information, how we choose to believe things that allow us to keep believing the things we already believe, uh, how we choose to reject information that uh, calls into question what we believe, um, and how um, we often are willing to attack the other side, uh, even if we're not exactly sure where we're getting our, our information from uh, in the first place. And so I'd like to begin by just talking a little bit about how some of, this, some of the problem with deciding what's true comes from our own beliefs that one, we're right about things, and two, most other people share our views. And so there's a lot of great research in the fields of social psychology and cognitive psychology, political science and mass communication uh, that suggests that we tend to overestimate how much people agree with us. And that makes us more confident to uh, behave in uncivil ways with people um, that we think we're uh, likely to disagree with. And, and a classic example of how that can backfire uh, it took place on, on Twitter a while ago. And I, just, I love showing this example um, where a, a person um, named Carol Bannon, who tweets as MA Catholic mom, um, tweeted uh, to Charles Cook, you should try going to a conservative source, open up your reading, open up your reading habits to include those with whom you would naturally dismiss. And so they were kind of getting into it about an issue uh, online uh, related to conservative politics. And Carol Bannon tells uh, Charles Cook, why don't you, you know, pay attention to conservative sources? And he replies by saying, well, I'm the editor of National Review Online, which is a very prominent national conservative source uh, of news. And so it just goes to show you that even when we're talking to people with whom we normally would agree, we can often interpret disagreement as someone being the enemy, which makes it a lot harder to come around and, and end up agreeing or believing something uh, that's true um, based upon these, these biases that we hold in our minds. I want to start by talking about two big trends that help explain why it is so hard for us to understand uh, and, and figure out what it is we can believe to be true. The first of which is in the figure you see on the left side of your screen, which is the, the decreasing level of trust uh, in the uh, mass media in the United States. And so the data here are from the Gallup organization um, beginning uh, near the end, uh, or I guess in the second term uh, of, of the uh, Bill Clinton administration and going through um, the, the first year uh, of the Trump administration. And we see a steady decline of more than 20% in the percentage of Americans who are willing to say that the mass media, these are newspapers, television, radio, um, can report the news fully and accurately and fairly a great deal or a fair amount of the time. So we've gone from more than half of the public thinking that the news media report the news um, pretty well to about a third of us thinking that. And if we backed this data up to the 1970s, we would see that we've dropped about 40 percentage points uh, since then. And so there's been a steady decline in the trust of news media. 
At the same time, looking to the figure on the right, there's been a growth in the polarization that takes place and that exists um, in, uh, or, or amongst our elected officials. So the data I'm showing here are, are the US Congress, but I could show you about 45 uh, other graphs from 45 of the 50 states to show something that looks a lot like this uh, at the state level and state legislatures as well. And what we see is that basically the distance between the average voting behavior of Republicans and Democrats in Congress generally is pretty polarized. The time that they, the red line, which are Republican voting behaviors in Congress and the blue line, which are the Democrats, the, the time that the, the distance between them is the narrowest is in the 1950s and early 1960s. This is a time after World War II, but before the civil rights movement really explodes in, in the 1960s, and is a time where the, the country was more moderate, both in terms of the electorate and elected officials. And not surprisingly, during that same time, we exhibited a high level of trust in the news media. But over the next several decades, Republicans became more conservative in Congress, Democrats became more liberal in Congress, and the distance between them increased. And as they did so, it correlated with the rise of first cable television, then the internet as a news source, and then finally social media as an information source. When, when I was growing up in the 1970s and 1980s, if we wanted the television on in our house at 5.30 when I was growing up in, in Minnesota, the news was on all three channels. And so if we wanted television entertainment at 5.30 and at 6 at, at my house, the news was on. And so people would watch mainstream network television news during a period of relative moderation in, in American politics. Now, of course, we have the three major networks, which still get more viewers than other stations do when it comes to news, but, but not nearly the share that they got in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But we also now have cable news that we can choose from. We have cable news that broadly reports the news of the day, cable news that reports news from a liberal perspective, and cable news that reports news from a conservative perspective. So now we can self-select and pick the news that's going to tell us we're right and the other side is wrong. Or we could use cable to not watch the news at all, but watch Sports Center on ESPN. It's almost time for the Lifetime Christmas movies to start on the Hallmark with Hallmark. And so we can watch all of these kinds of things that completely avoid politics. And so we have some people selecting into politics and getting more extreme. Other people completely jettisoning themselves from politics and not voting, not participating, not knowing as much about what's going on, all in an environment where the elected officials we choose are more and more different from each other than they have ever been. This makes it difficult for us to figure out what's true, especially because, as it turns out, we choose our news fairly selectively. So uh, in, in a wide variety of different kinds of uh, political communication experiments, researchers have found that when you show people a bunch of different options for stories they might want to click on. So imagine going to a Google News homepage or a Yahoo News homepage, someplace that offers you a choice between many different news sources to choose from. And in experiments that have been run uh, both at Stanford and here at uh, UW-Madison, what we found is that when you show hard news headlines about crime and the economy and healthcare and education and national security and taxes and issues like that, um, or when you report on soft news headlines related to the weather or civic life or sports or you know, things like that, entertainment news, um, people tend to choose their news fairly selectively. And so in the experiments, what would happen is there would be a list of headlines on the screen. And then after each headline, we would vary, and other scholars who do this work too, uh, would vary the source of who gave the headline. So did that headline come from Fox News, from CNN, from National Public Radio, the Associated Press? Was there no source listed after it? And we would just kind of randomly assign the source to the headline so that we could be sure that people were choosing a story based upon who was reporting it rather than what the topic was. And then uh, we compared across um, what people chose. And so here the data you're seeing come from uh, researchers uh, Shanto Einigar and Q Han at Stanford, and we replicated this at uh, Wisconsin as well, but they, they were the first to do it, so I want to show you their data. Um, basically what they find is that Democrats, whether it's hard news or soft news, are more likely to choose not Fox News. They picked CNN, they picked NPR, they didn't pick one of those more than the other, um, but they tended to pick that the most when it came to picking which source they wanted to hear from. 
Republicans, on the other hand, were way more likely to pick Fox as compared to anything else. And so you see the big differences there between how often Democrats and Republicans would pick Fox or how often they would pick CNN or, or NPR or even just a story w without a source altogether. Whereas independents really didn't show a, a discernible difference between each other. And so whether it's hard news or soft news, partisans in the electorate choose their news selectively. We even click selectively. And so looking at studies of uh, highly popular uh, liberal and conservative blogs, um, we can see that people on the right are way more likely to click on the strong conservative blogs. People on the left are more likely to click on, on the liberal blogs. And so we tend to be, um, partially at least, putting ourselves in information environments and communication ecologies that are reinforcing our own points of view and are telling us that the other side uh, is wrong uh, when they uh, offer their own, their own ideas. So then the question becomes, right, are we being persuaded by the message or the messenger, right? One reason people give for choosing the source that they choose is that they trust it to be telling us the truth. This is especially true uh, for conservatives who for decades have railed against the news media claiming that the news media in general are biased to a liberal perspective. And so uh, arguments from many conservatives, especially those who tend to prefer Fox News, are that the problem is that the mainstream media aren't telling us the truth, and so therefore we choose this other source, Fox News, which we trust to tell us the truth. On the other hand, liberals argue that the mainstream news media report what both major political parties are arguing about any given issue, and they would rather sort through those arguments than just hear one perspective that highlights a conservative point of view. And so to try to figure out who's right, or if we can even figure out who's right in this argument, one strategy is to try to figure out are we persuaded by the content of news? In other words, what the actual information is in the story? Who are the people quoted? What do they say? How do journalists frame the issue? Are they giving more time to one side than the other? Are they using loaded language when they compare one side to the other? Or is it just that we see who the source of the story is and make up our mind before we even see the content? And so to pull this apart in experiments, researchers have tried, tried some pretty creative things where they'll find uh, local television anchors who don't live in the community where a study is taking place so that the anchor is someone who the local public doesn't recognize. And they have them read two stories, one that aired on CNN and one that aired on Fox. But they have them read those stories in front of a, a green screen like a meteorologist stands in front of so that they can put any background in that story that they would like. And what the researchers then do is they um, have the, the news anchor read the CNN story with a CNN news background. So it looks like that reporter is reporting for CNN. Then in the next condition, the anchor reads that exact same story, the CNN story, but has the Fox News background superimposed behind them with the Fox News crawl on the bottom of the screen. And then they do the same thing with Fox. The, the, the anchor reads a Fox story and it looks like he's on Fox. The anchor reads a Fox story and it looks like he's on CNN. And then we ask people, was that story biased? And so if in this particular figure, you're seeing a scale that goes between zero and 50. 25 would be a perfectly balanced story that doesn't favor liberals or conservatives. 50 would be a story that is purely conservatively biased and, and has no, nothing redeeming uh, or, or offering from the liberal perspective. Zero would be just the reverse, completely liberally biased, only supporting liberals with, with nothing um, that uh, promotes a conservative point of view. And what you're seeing here is data that looks at strong liberals, strong conservatives, and political moderates. And what the data are showing us is that no matter if the story was the CNN story or was the Fox story, when liberals thought they were seeing it on CNN, they gave it about a 25, right? That, that almost perfect score of outstanding journalism. They're the yellow bar on the left. Whereas conservatives, the red bar, they saw that story on CNN and thought it was really liberally biased, even if it was the story that had actually originally aired on Fox News. Conversely, when Fox News was the source. Liberals thought that exact same story, the one that they liked on CNN, was, was now conservatively biased. And conservatives, who thought that that same story was liberal on CNN, now found it to be a, a nice, excellent, modern piece of American journalism that was perfectly balanced. And so part of our problem in deciding what's true is that we make up our mind about the veracity of the story and its bias before we see it before we hear what's said. We make up our mind often based on the messenger. So that's one problem that exists when it comes to deciding what's true. 
Another problem is more something that we might blame on journalists, and that's their willingness to use uh, people on the street interviews and people off of Twitter um, quotes as good representations of public opinion. But as it turns out, it's really easy to make a phony Twitter account. And many different countries and many different organizations that would seek to sow chaos in the US or at least seek, uh, to, or, or, or perhaps even seek to, to help one side or the other in a political election are really aggressively attempting to make these fake Twitter accounts that, that researchers like me call sock puppets. We call them sock puppets because just as um, when you put your hand in a sock and make it talk for, for, for your child, um, it, you know, the, the sock isn't really talking, right? You're doing the talking for the sock. And the same kind of thing happens on Twitter um, to an alarming degree and to a degree um, that we found in, in a piece that uh, one of my students, Josephine Lakito, uh, published in the Columbia Journalism Review was that most major news organizations regularly get fooled by, which is to say they include tweets in their stories as examples of public opinion from, from Twitter accounts that are not real people but are from Twitter accounts that different bot detection services and, and researchers have found either originate in Russia or Macedonia or are created by um, political organizations trying to sow discord uh, in, in our own political system. And so an example of that, um, you see here uh, this tweet that I've uh, uh, kind of um, outlined in red, where it looks like the account is some official organ of the Tennessee Republican Party. Their, their Twitter symbol is, you know, at T-E-N underscore G-O-P. So it looks like the Tennessee GOP are tweeting out that Stephen Miller, uh, who works for the president, calling Jim Acosta, who works for CNN, ignorant on live TV is the best thing I've seen all week. But 10 GOP was actually uh, created in a bot farm uh, and is not a representative Twitter account of the Tennessee Republican Party uh, at all. Uh, and so um, we see that these kinds of things are often um, included in stories in the news. And then we think that official Republican organizations in this example are saying things that they are just not saying. And so when we, and we see the same thing now um, on the other side, um, there was this, um, this story uh, that, that appeared at a bunch of different news organizations um, related to uh, a, a, an arrest the, that, that, that went violent. Uh, and then we see this tweet from a person supposedly named Crystal Johnson, who is criticizing the police saying is selling flowers a crime now. Crystal Johnson comes from a, Mad a Macedonian bot farm uh, and is not a real person, but got picked up by news organizations and plugged into stories as what the conversation on Twitter was saying about something, which then tells us something that's not true uh, as we try to interpret news stories, trying to think about what is true. Another problem um, relates to the interaction between our behavior and the behavior of different news organizations, especially on social media. And so when I wanted to walk through kind of an example of how stories that are not true um, can go viral and can go viral uh, extraordinarily quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a real life example of the adage that the that a lie can make its way around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on. And we saw that happen almost four years ago, right after the election uh, in 2016, uh, when Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton uh, to become president elect. And so the story that uh, goes around here is between the time uh, that then candidate Trump won the election and the time that then president Trump took the inauguration uh, and the oath of office. And so uh, in no early November after the election, uh, then President-elect Trump goes to Austin, Texas to give a speech. Uh, and this person, Eric Tucker on Twitter, takes a photograph of some buses outside of a hotel and tweets, anti-Trump protesters in Austin today are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses they came in. And you can see that at the time we scraped this uh, tweet off of Twitter, he already had 16,000 people share that tweet by retweeting it into their own information networks. And another 14,000 people ex expressed that they liked um, that, that, that same post. And so we begin with this, where th this tweet of the photograph of buses uh, in Austin begins getting uh, shared uh, on Twitter. Quickly, elites pick up that message. Uh, um, a Free Republic uh, Facebook page um, tweeted out, or, or I'm sorry, I posted on Facebook, uh, they found the buses, dozens are lined up blocks away from the Austin protests, and it's just repeating the story, and you might notice using the, the picture uh, from Eric Tucker from his Twitter account, and then the same thing happens um, with President-elect Trump, 
uh, who um, tweets out that they just had a very open and successful presidential election, but now professional protesters incited by the media are protesting very unfair. And you might notice how the person that we hadn't heard of before, Eric Tucker, had 14,000 likes, which is a lot on Twitter, but President-elect Trump has over 200,000 and had over 150,000 retweets as well. So in other words, uh, over 150,000 people saw President-elect Trump's tweet and then shared it in their own networks. And so now you have the next leader of the free world saying that this story is true, that um, professional protesters were bust in um, to, to try to make it look as though there were lots of protesters at his speech in Austin after he won the election. Then the ideological media began to follow. And so organizations like Breitbart, uh, Right Wing News, and the Gateway Pundit all posted on their websites and on their Facebook pages and on their Twitter accounts, you know, things like this. In figures, anti-Trump protesters were bussed into to Austin for fake protests. Um, or guess who's bussing in all of those anti-Trump protesters? Um, and all of these stories refer to the tweet and the information that Eric Tucker originally shared um, when he was um, tweeting out uh, his picture. It turns out that after millions of shares and likes and retweets on Facebook and Twitter, and dozens of major news organizations reporting the story, and the president-elect amplifying the story, it turns out that this isn't true at all. It turns out that the buses were taking accountants from one part of a conference in one hotel uh, to another hotel and the other part of their accounting conference uh, in Austin uh, that happened to be going on uh, after the election uh, in Austin in November. So these, pro these buses weren't um, taking protesters anywhere. They were taking accountants um, to one seminar uh, to another seminar uh, across town. And later, uh, Eric Tucker uh, tweeted out a correction. Uh, once he learned the truth, he felt bad about it and, and tweeted out that he was wrong and that this wasn't uh, a case of uh, protesters being bussed in uh, to uh, try to sully the president's uh, positive speech. Um, but that tweet uh, got less than 500 shares. Um, you know, an order of magnitude less than what was shared, um, spreading the false story. And so corrections just don't have the legs uh, that, that, that the fake news uh, can have. One reason that's true is that folks um, in the country are increasingly likely by some measures to begin endorsing uh, what we might think of as conspiracy theories. These are theories that suggest an unseen small group of elite actors are secretly controlling what it is that's happening uh, in the country. And it turns out that this is not something that either Republicans or Democrats are more likely to endorse. Um, the factors that predict our likelihood of believing in conspiracism aren't whether we're conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat, uh, it's whether we trust uh, the news media and trust our political institutions and whether we have a lot of knowledge uh, about politics. And it turns out that people with a lot of knowledge but low trust are the ones who are the most likely to believe in conspiracy theories. And one thing that kind of interacts with those factors and amplifies the effect is if your side is the losing side in a political battle. So for example, uh, Clinton supporters became more likely to endorse conspiracy theories right after the 2016 election, right? Uh, Hillary Clinton had been leading in, in uh, the national polls uh, and had been leading in, in many swing state uh, polls going up to the election. And while her national vote total was right on the money with the national polls, her performance in swing states was not. And President Trump uh, won uh, the election. And so liberals often pointed to different conspiracies after that, especially those who had low trust in the news and low trust in institutions, but high knowledge about politics. Because there's, there must have been some explanation for why Hillary Clinton lost that is a, a conspiracy and is, is an example of, of a group of people secretly controlling outcomes. The reverse happens in 2018 when the Democrats have large gains in the midterm elections. And then Democrats became less likely to endorse conspiratorial explanations and Republicans became more likely uh, to endorse uh, conspiratorial uh, explanations about, about what happens. And once again, it's driven more by having low trust and high knowledge than it is by being a Republican or, or a Democrat um, in the first place. So one thing that news organizations try to do to help mitigate these problems and try to 
allay our fears about unseen conspiracies and, and try to adjudicate disputes about things our, our lawmakers say and claims they make about things that are true is to engage in a relatively new style of journalism called fact checking, which comparatively has, hasn't been around nearly as long as, as just you know, traditional um, journalism that indexes what uh, Republican leaders say and what Democrat, Democratic leaders say and then saying, okay, now we've told you what both sides think, now you decide. A fact check actually takes a position on what the verifiable truth is. And uh, the question is, you know, do they work? Do they actually influence uh, what people believe about politics? And before we can even understand whether they work, it's important to think, that, think through some of the problems that fact checkers face as they go into the work of trying to decide to take a claim that a leader makes, decide whether to fact check it, and then decide how to communicate the results of that fact check to the public. So uh, in my colleague Lucas Graves' book, Deciding What's True, The Rise of Political Fact Checking in American Journalism, he, uh, he chronicles how fact checkers really struggle over the claims to check because they don't want to be accused of being biased. And it's easy to want to check the claims of the most powerful people, right? So if, you're, if your governor is a Democrat, maybe there are more fact checks of the Democratic governor because that's the person who's sitting at the top of, of, of the state politically. Or if the pre president's a Republican, we would expect more fact checks of the president given that um, the president sits on the top of, of the national uh, political stage. That, of course, interacts with how often those leaders say things uh, that are questionable enough to get fact-checked by a reporter. And those things, of course, aren't spread equally throughout all politicians. Some politicians stretch the truth more than others, and so those folks are way more likely to get fact-checked than, than those who stick closer uh, to the verifiable truth when they're making public claims. And so fact checkers struggle over how to do this because they don't want to be called biased, but they also don't want to not check people who are playing fast and loose with the truth on a regular basis. The second thing they struggle with is how to actually rate the claim. Do they use a, a meter or not? So a meter is something that a group like a PolitiFact uses, where after they uh, do their fact check, they tell you whether that claim is true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, or pants on fire if it's an especially egregious lie. Some fact checkers think that that meter uh, is problematic because having a midpoint lets the fact checkers kind of punt and say, well, if we don't want to say it's more false than true, we'll just say it's half true, half false. And that way the readers uh, of the fact check aren't really being given uh, the whole story about what's true. Another problem with the meter is that um, rarely do we find fact checkers check things that end up being true because they tend to be systematically uh, in favor of checking claims that appear dubious to them. And so that might lead us to believe that things politicians say are more likely to be false when in fact what's happening is that the claims they pick to check are more likely to be false. But if they were checking most of the things our leaders say they might find that those claims were true. And so that, that's another issue that, that kind of affects how, how uh, fact checking works. Um, and then finally, fact checkers struggle with their desire to, to balance telling the truth with not wanting to advocate for a particular position. So if it's the case that people who are debating, for example, uh, the, the abortion issue, if, if one side um, makes claims that aren't true and get regularly fact checked, fact checkers might worry that people would then conclude that the fact checkers are actually endorsing the political position of the other side. When in fact, what they're trying to do is just say, no, no, the things these folks are saying aren't true. That, that it's not related to whether their policy position is something the country ought to pursue. It's related to whether the things they're saying are true or not. And those are different things, but that's not how most of us interpret uh, political news. So it turns out um, that fact checking uh, is sometimes beneficial, but at other times it can cause some really significant problems. In fact, there's evidence that sometimes a fact check that corrects the record uh, can backfire, by which uh, we mean that it actually leads people who were believing something that was false to believe that even with more extremity than they believed it before seeing the fact check that told them they were wrong. And it turns out that this happens to conservatives and liberals in relatively equal measure. So one study uh, conducted by uh, Brendan Nyhan, who's a professor at Dartmouth, and Jason Reifler, who's a professor uh, at Exeter, um, showed that um, in the case of conservatives, they were shown a fact check about whether um, the United States military found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq uh, before the 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq uh, from the US and coalition forces. And at that point, 
weapons of mass destruction uh, had not been found. Uh, and so the fact check showed that weapons of mass destruction hadn't been found despite claims that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. When people who were strongly conservative were shown that story, they ended up being more confident that weapons of mass destruction had been found. In other words, they, they believed more of what was false uh, than what was true, which is the exact opposite thing a fact check is trying to, uh, to, ha to get to happen to the public. It turns out the same thing happened uh, for liberals. Um, in the same study, uh, the authors showed a fact check about stem cell research um, and whether President Bush had banned all stem cell research, which he had not. Uh, President Bush had um, allowed all existing lines of stem cell research to continue and put a stop on new stem cell lines, uh, 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 new stem cell research of new lines of, of those cells. And one reason stem cells are so controversial is because many of them come from aborted fetuses, which makes them, of course, a very hot button uh, political issue. And so when liberals were shown the fact check that said President Bush did not outright ban stem cell uh, research, the very liberal folks still became more likely to be more extreme in holding the incorrect, uh, the, the unfactual uh, point of view. So this thing can happen to both uh, conservatives and liberals. One explanation for what happens or what this is, is, is called motivated reasoning. And motivated reasoning is the interaction of the emotions we feel when we're told that something we believe is, is not true and, the, edu or, and the, the ability we have to, take at, to use evidence to make arguments that support our, our original way of thinking. So we feel, we feel mad or upset or anxious or, or something negative when we're told that what we believe um, has a factual inaccuracy to it. And then we look for evidence to continue supporting our own point of view. And it turns out that the folks who do this the most are the educated, uh, because when they uh, have increasing education, they keep getting taught how to make good arguments with evidence. Um, what we don't apparently do as good of a job teaching about is how to help people make arguments with evidence that also um, fit in line with what we can, can demonstrate is, is ver verifiably true. This led scholars to wonder, well, what can we do to fight back against this tendency that, that those of us who are the most committed to politics have when it comes to understanding what's true and what's not and, and believing things that, um, that, that are true rather than believing things that feel good but are false. And it turns out one thing that really helps are visual aids in journalism. In other words, at visual evidence. And so a, a set of scholars, uh, once again, some of the same folks who did the backfire study I was just talking about, um, did a study where they wrote, uh, they, they showed some liberals in their, their sample of people they were studying a printed news story about the number of attacks that took place uh, in Iraq. This is again around the, during that kind of Iraq war period uh, during uh, President George W. Bush's term. And they, they showed them a story about how after President Bush initiated his strategy called the surge, fewer attacks on American uh, soldiers uh, took place in Iraq. And when liberals saw that story, they didn't become any more likely to believe that the surge uh, had preceded a decrease in attacks. In the second condition, they had the exact same story with the exact same words, but included this picture that you see here uh, on the slide, which is a chronicling of the number of attacks that took place in Iraq, a big orange ball that says surge begins, and then a few months thereafter seeing uh, those attacks drop uh, precipitously. When liberals saw the story and the graphic, they became more likely to believe what was true, which was that the number of attacks did decrease after the surge began. Same thing was true for conservatives on the issue of climate change. When uh, one group of conservatives was shown a news story that was just the printed word saying that four different global meteorological organizations had shown that the temperature on the earth was getting warmer over the last four decades, conservatives weren't any more likely to believe it than not after reading the story. When another group of conservatives was shown that same story plus this graphic of all four organizations temperature readings and the change in temperature over time showing that they basically overlap each other and increase markedly over the course of a four decade period, conservatives then said, yes, it looks like the climate is changing and it is getting hotter. And so there are things that can help us decide what's true and it's usually a mix of the written word and visual graphics that, that tell us a similar story. That's something journalists can do. What we can do is be willing to admit what we don't know. 
In a study uh, I conducted with my graduate student Janice Lee that was just published earlier this month in Journal of Communication, we wanted to understand when fact checks might work and for whom are they the most successful at helping. And we grouped people into five different categories of, of people. And what we did was um, ask them a series of questions about whether a list of 25 claims were true or false. They were all claims that had been fact checked by multiple news organizations. And so we only picked claims where more than one fact checker had weighed in on what the truth was and agreed about what the truth was. So we gave folks this, this kind of quiz of 25 claims and we asked them, is this claim true? And people could say yes, no, or I don't know. And then after that, we asked them after each claim, how sure are you about that? And people could say they were extremely certain, they were somewhat sure, they were somewhat unsure, or they weren't sure at all, they were just guessing when we asked them before. And then we put people into five categories. People who said they didn't know were called uninformed. People who said, here's my answer, and I'm sure, and were wrong, we called misinformed. So if you were wrong, but you were sure about it, you're misinformed. If you were correct and sure, we called you informed. If you were correct but said you were guessing, we called you ambiguously informed. If you were wrong but said you were guessing, we called you ambiguously uninformed. And after we knew which category of person each of our participants fit in, we then showed them a fact check about one of the issues they had uh, been answering questions about. And then we asked them the, the, that same question again about whether this particular statement was true. And as you can see here on the graphic, at the second the second time we ask them the question, the uninformed do just as well as the informed at getting the answer right. In other words, not choosing uh, the incorrect answer um, the second time around. So people who are willing to admit what they don't know and then are shown information end up believing what's true. People who were wrong and sure they were right, the misinformed, are no more likely than not to be helped by a fact check. So part of the problem lies with the, in our own ability or inability uh, to admit what we know or don't know. And so um, actually I'm gonna skip over this for time and just talk about one other thing journalists can do um, to um, help improve the likelihood that we'll trust the information we get from them. And that is be more transparent about what they do. Uh, the Center for Media Engagement at the University of Texas uh, did a study where they actually got real news organizations to sometimes put what you see on the left here uh, in their stories. So they would write next to the news story they published on the front page of their paper a sidebar about why we wrote this story. So here's a couple of sentences about why we think this issue is important. And then we have bullet points about who we interviewed with links to their credentials we tell you where the story was written. We tell you who edited the story. We reveal whether we had to make any corrections. We reveal whether a version of the story changed uh, from the first time it was published online. Um, and, uh, you know, providing all that information at once. And it turns out that when that kind of transparent information is provided next to a story, people are way more likely to trust that information than when it's not provided. And so offering a transparent take on why journalists are doing what they're doing uh, can be really helpful to help uh, make it easier for us to trust the news. And as we were discussing before, related to motivated reasoning and conspiracy theories and the belief in those sorts of things, the more we trust our information sources, the less likely we are to believe in conspiracies, the less likely we are to engage in that motivated reasoning, which means the more likely we are to be able to decide what's true, even uh, in a polarized society. So with that, I'll stop because it's been about 40 minutes and I'll take uh, the questions uh, that you all have and, and talk about those um, with, uh, with you and with Joy. And thanks so much for, for being here and I look forward to what's next. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, well, we do have uh, several questions and I'll get right to them. But since we just ended with um, a little bit of talk about the fact checking, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times, uh, Mike, I have posted a a fact check on someone's social media post, you know, some outlandish claim that I knew to be false. And I would put a, a fact check on it saying, you know, that's not true. And invariably I would get, well, that fact checker is biased. I, I don't believe the fact check, check because um, I think this outlandish thing is true. Talk a little bit about that problem and you know, it, people just sh continuing to share information that has already been fact-checked as false. 
yeah, it's it's a frustrating and complicated and annoying feature of of human life on planet Earth, right? And and we see that in, in some of the research um, that uh, that a group I work with here at UW is engaged in. So we we're just about to publish a study um, that uh, kind of follows up on the study I was talking about about people being willing to admit what they don't know. And then in the next study, we we did, we kind of did that again and once again replicated that you know fact checks can work. They can persuade people uh, to believe things that they didn't believe before. But we found that an unfortunate consequence of a really effective fact check is that it often leads people to believe that that source that did the fact checking is biased. And in some respects, we can understand why that is, right? Typically, journalists were taught, tell, you know, what side A says and what side B says and give them, you know, the, the best versions of their arguments and, and tell that story in a balanced and objective way uh, that hews to what you know is verifiably true and let the audience decide. A fact checker doesn't do that. A fact checker says this thing is true and this thing is false. And so it makes sense that people might think that that is different than traditional journalism. Uh, the problem is that when folks call it biased, that's kind of a misunderstanding of what bias is. Bias is a distortion from reality. And a fact check is providing us the best case that we have for what reality looks like. And so it's really frustrating, but it is uh, a consequence uh, of fact checking is that even when it's effective, even when it changes people's views and leads them to believe what's more likely to be verifiably true, it also leads some of those same folks to believe that the source was biased. Um, and then it might, which we don't know, but we're trying to investigate, but we think it might have a long-term effect on people's overall trust for that source and for other sources. And so if the fact check helped me learn what was true in this one case, but starts to cut into my trust for that source, I might not go back to that source, even though they showed me something that was true. And so it's, it's a really, it's a complicated thing. And, and, and sadly, um, I'm not aware of any, of any evidence that helps us feel better about that predilection that, that you point out seeing on social media. We have a question from Deborah who says, shouldn't fact checking be an automatic system on social media? So, um, if we could, if we could, um, you know, do a kind of a, you know, bewitched moment and just make what we wish to be true, that would be great, right? But, it, but fact checking first is really hard to do. Um, and, and second, it's hard to do in real time at the scale that social media exists on, right? Like, right now, while I'm talking, I could pull up my Twitter account and type something in and share it. And that won't take any effort at all. But to fact check that claim, would take quite a bit of effort. First, the claim would have to be discovered. Then they would have to contact me and ask, why did I say that? How do I believe, why do I know, that? why do I think that's true? And then they would need to search out all of the evidence they could try to find to demonstrate what I was saying was true or false or somewhere in between. And so it's really hard to instantaneously do that. That said, some social media companies are trying to do more of this sort of thing. And so Facebook now partners with a bunch of different fact-checking organizations um, and will label uh, posts that have been fact-checked in a news, like, or, or label claims that have been fact-checked um, in posts that appear as uh, something that's been fact-checked. And then you could even click and see if that claim was, you know, supported by the evidence or, or not supported by the evidence. The question is, you know, Facebook can't do that with every post that happens on um, at a pace that's equal to the kinds of things that get posted. And so it's easy to, to cry bias again and say, oh, well, they fact check this claim, but not that one. And it could be that it's systematic bias that the problem is, is causing that. But it also could just be, it's hard to do this stuff. And the, the false claims happen really, really quickly. And the, and the, the fact checks to, to pick up the pieces are slower and, and, and um, don't move uh, at, at the same rate of speed or at the same volume uh, that the false claims do. But there are social media organizations trying to do this. Um, at the same time, they don't enforce their policies um, in ways that are consistent. And so sometimes you'll see Facebook take down the post of one candidate and when they're shown a similar post from a candidate on the other side, Facebook doesn't take it down. Or Facebook will say, we're not gonna publish or we're not gonna um, let people make advertisements about winning or losing the election, but we'll let presidential candidates claim whatever they want in an advertisement and not take it down even if it's false. Uh, and so the inconsistency uh, that social media companies approach fact checking is also maddening. 
Yeah, there was um, a story that's in the news uh, this morning. It was a, a New York Post article. It was restricted on Facebook. I think they said it wasn't widely dis distributed um, and, and Twitter may have actually blocked it. I, I, I'm not positive, but they said it was a thinly sourced report with links to Russian disinformation. Um, and I, we don't have to go into the specific allegations since it's um, supposedly disinformation, but I just wanted, I, I guess I wanted your reaction to um, Russian disinformation and how it, uh, how, how big of a problem you think that is, especially during this election cycle and whether the social media, you know, blocking or, or um, labeling it is, uh, is helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, my, my take on the answer is that it's really complicated. So on the one hand, there is a lot of disinformation flowing around social media and some uh, news media organizations, especially ones that are more uh, ideological in, in, their, in their nature. Um, and so there's a lot of that information floating around and the, the posts that tend to get the most engagement the most likes or shares on Facebook and Twitter are often uh, sources that are sharing misinformation. So that sounds really bad. On the other hand, there's not a lot of evidence uh, that people who see that misinformation use that information when they're casting a vote. In other words, um, if you really like Donald Trump and you see misinformation about Joe Biden, you already really like Donald Trump. And so this misinformation isn't changing your vote choice. Um, it might make you more enthusiastic about going to the polls, but it's probably not changing your, your vote choice. And so the, the evidence about how misinformation affects the vote is, is, is pretty thin. And, and we don't have a, a lot of reason to feel really nervous about misinformation affecting vote choice. But we do have reason to worry about misinformation keeping other things off of our radar, right? We can only pay attention to so many things. And if part of what we're paying attention to are these things that aren't true, then we lose the opportunity to learn things that are true. And that might change our vote choice. That might change whether we want to show up and participate. That might change whether we want to persuade or try to persuade a friend about how to vote. And so kind of the indirect effects are sometimes more uh, deleterious than the actual direct effects of misinformation on voting behavior. Emma wants to know how long does it take to discover that something comes from a bot? Couldn't they be labeled somehow on social media? There are some uh, organizations that do a pretty good job of this. Um, there is a, I can't remember if it's, if it's a site or if it's just the name of the tool, but if you Google bot or not, um, Indiana University is doing one of this, I think through their Ozome lab, but if you go bot or not Indiana, you'll find it. And, and they have a tool where you can enter a Twitter account's um, you know, name uh, into uh, the, the, the tool and it will give you a, a, a kind of a probability uh, that that, that, um, that account is a bot or not. And so how do they do this? Well, they, they take a look at when, it, when um, information gets shared and then they look at kind of the language used in the posts. And so when, you know, bots aren't human, so they don't have to sleep. And so they tend to share at equal intervals throughout the day, whereas humans share a lot when they wake up in the morning and pick up their phone and do something and then share a lot at lunchtime and share a lot at dinner time. And so humans behave differently than bots. And so that's one way they're detected. Another way they're detected is whether they're sharing stories from reputable sources or phony news sites. That's another way they're detected. Um, but bot or not is a pretty good one. Um, there's a researcher at the University of Missouri named Mike Kearney, who also has a tool um, on the web that, that performs as well as bot or not in terms of trying to figure that stuff out. Um, some, some news organizations, after it was revealed uh, in, in that CJR piece I, I talked about, that they use tweets that aren't from real people in their stories as examples of public opinion, are now um, requiring their journalists to, to put the, the Twitter handles of people they might use in a story through the bot or not. Um, to at least demonstrate that it's a person, or uh, they might require that the journalist try to contact that person on Twitter and say, hey, can I use your quote that you, or your tweet uh, in a story? And if they don't get a response, um, it doesn't mean they're a bot, but, but it's, it's more evidence than if they get a response from a real person. Yeah, a couple of questions that are related to what fact checkers are the most accurate um, NPR or Fox, or you know, is there, what kind of, which fact checker should we trust the most? So I, I think that the, the best shorthand you can use is to see whether the fact checker is IFCN certified, which means that the International Fact Checking Network 
has um, examined a set of fact checks done by that organization, has examined the financial records of that fact checking organization, has examined the corrections policy of that organization, uh, and has examined um, the transparency of whether they admit who their, their reporters are. And so uh, fact checking organizations apply for IFCN certification and then people look at the fact like the, a set of fact checks that place produced their financial records and all that kind of stuff and then either um, recommend them or don't recommend them to get certified by this international fact checking network uh, from the Pointer Institute. And so groups that have undergone that process uh, have been vetted by an outside agency, um, which to me makes them a little bit more credible than just those um, who, who um, say they're a fact checker, uh, but, but haven't had anybody uh, independently uh, review their work. That doesn't mean all of these organizations are perfect and fact checkers make mistakes, which is why you want them to have a strong corrections policy. Um, but um, I would say that's probably the, the best thing to do would be to see, um, you can easily find a, a list of, of the organizations that are certified around the globe by, by that I, IFCN. Deborah wants to know, how about if we legislate social media to be public utilities and regulate them? Any thoughts on that? Boy, the social media companies don't want that to happen. <laughs> uh, social media companies have been fighting aggressively to get regulated in particular ways uh, related to privacy protection so that they're not allowed to reveal private information about people so that one, that gives people who use those platforms confidence that their private information won't be shared. And two, they can say we are regulated. Um, but of course, there are other regulations that we might, you know, think about. Um, and and we've, we've regulated the news media more than we currently do as well in terms of who can own, uh, how much someone can own, uh, or how much a company can own uh, in, in any given media market, or whether um, there's a required fairness in terms of the opportunity that, um, competing sides have to airtime or, or something like that. And so we, we, might, we might be able to do that. But right now, the social media companies are aggressively lobbying against um, that, kind of, that kind of regulation. I'm just going to bring up a real life example of um, fake news and fact checking and, and, and everything else. Uh, you know, on, on one hand, we hear that COVID-19 is a deadly global pandemic and our best defense against it is to wear masks and to social distance and wash our hands. And on the other hand, we have, um, despite, you know, hammering away that this is what the scientists are saying and this is, you know, everybody's saying these are the, these are the facts, we have another side saying it's, um, it's not, you know, it's a hoax or it's just not all that bad. And, um, and you know, we should just, it's just going to go away. I mean, what accounts for that, Mike? That's a great question. Um, I should say at the outset uh, that I'm biased on this answer. So I'm part of a group that put together an app for Wisconsin called COVID-19 Wisconsin Connect, where we have a fact checker about COVID claims. Um, so, so I'm, uh, I'm of the belief that we should follow what the scientists are telling us about how the virus is spread and, and how dangerous it is and for whom it's dangerous. Um, but I think, you know, one reason this happens is that people vary in their risk tolerance. Um, one reason this happens is people vary in how much they trust scientific information and information from the news media. And part of it is the messages they get from uh, the people uh, that they're most like who are in elite political positions. And so, for example, the president um, is, you know, famous for not wearing masks, holding rallies of unmasked people for long periods of time um, together and, um, you know, is, is famously now, you know, kind of presided over a, a nominating uh, ceremony for um, Judge uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who, you know, where a few dozen people now at least to got, got, seem to have gotten the COVID virus at that um, event. And, and we know, for example, you know, Herman Cain caught COVID at a Trump rally and died. Um, he'd been a presidential candidate in a prior cycle. And so um, the messages we get from our elites matter, right? If, if, if President Trump said, everybody should wear a mask all the time when they're indoors with other people or outdoors in large groups, um, that would have a huge effect on people's mask wearing beliefs. On the other hand, most Republicans and most Democrats believe you should wear a mask when you're around others. Um, and and th there's a partisan gap, but it's still the case that majorities in both parties uh, believe that um, people should wear masks, people should wash their hands, people should stay socially distant, um, and those kinds of things. They might vary about their risk tolerance and whether they want to go to a restaurant or a movie theater or, or a school. Um, but they tend, you know, there tends to be widespread agreement about 
some behaviors that would be useful, even if uh, leaders from both sides aren't um, sharing those, those ideas with equal vigor. Well, I, we have uh, um, less than a minute to go here. Um, could you leave us with um, some thoughts on how we can, as individuals, not contribute to um, to the, the the problem of of disinformation, fake news uh, in um, in our society. Sure, we all get duped. I've been duped. Everybody will get duped by something that's phony out there. I think two things we can do are one, if you see a story that makes the other side look terrible and it makes you kind of happy to see it, don't click share right away. Think about who who's reporting this. And just Google, is anybody else reporting this? If no one else is, it's probably too good to be true and it's probably not true. Uh, and then the second thing is that if you are aware of a claim that's out there um, and you see somebody talking about it on social media and that claim's not true, you could, pe people tend to take corrections from their friends on social media better than strangers. And they tend to take corrections better when you link to the fact check. Um, now, not always, right? And, some, and, and, and as your own experience bears out in, in an earlier question, this doesn't always work, but it works better than the other things do. I think this, that's where we're going to have to leave it since uh, it's, it's, it's uh, one o'clock, um, or I should say two o'clock. Thanks very much uh, for joining us, uh, Mike. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, we, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Wagner is a professor of journalism and mass communications at UW-Madison. And I hope that uh, you will stay with us um, and join us for future lectures on, on Plato. We will have uh, another lecture coming up on October 29th at 10 a.m. We stand on their shoulders, a history of Wisconsin women and voting. You can check out platomadison.org for many more lectures and activities that are coming your way. And thanks for being here and thanks for joining us. Bye.